<clears throat> Welcome into Outkick the Show, boys and girls. I'm back from vacation. I hope you guys had a fantastic week without me. I hope you are ready to roll. Not a vacation day coming in a little while. So I am off and running. Welcome into Outkick the Show. As you can see, we have new banners. Uh, new banners that have arrived. And uh, I want to tell you, and thank you once more, we have a new presenting sponsor for the show. They are sportsbookreview.com. I would encourage you to go check out sportsbookreview.com. Get ready for all of the NCAA action that is headed our way, whether it is the NCAA tournament with who knows which teams are actually going to be playing, whether it is all of the excitement from the conference title games, uh, and conference, uh, sorry, conference, uh, uh, conference tournaments. All of that you can get informed and be ready to roll if you go to sportsbookreview.com. Now you can probably tell a little bit by my voice. I am fighting through a sickness. My voice has started to go. If you listen to the radio show this morning, you notice that that happened. That's because when you go on a family vacation, you don't actually go on vacation, you go on a family trip. I'm going to give you my review of the Disney trip here at the end of, uh, of the show. But I want to tell you also, I mentioned the conference tournaments coming up. I will be in St. Louis. If you are going to be in St. Louis watching the SEC basketball tournament, my crew at The Home Loan Expert, Ryan Kelly and crew, have been giving away an incredible suite at the Scott Trade Arena there in downtown St. Louis and you can register for the title game. The drawing is tomorrow. You'll be glad that you did. I will be there on Friday and Saturday watching games. Possibly I will still be there on Sunday. I haven't decided. I haven't booked my flight officially yet but I'm telling you guys make sure that you register at thehomeloanexpert.com. All right we've got a lot to get to. We've got a lot to get to in today's show. Several stories have stacked up. Obviously the massive story associated with the um, college basketball crisis in general. So we're going to start there, giving you a rundown on where we're headed today. I'm going to talk about the college basketball scandal. Uh, we're going to talk about LeBron versus Laura Ingram at Fox News. What did I think about that when it went public last week? Greg Popovich commented on it again last night. I'll discuss that. I'll tell you why the movie Black Panther is the single most overrated movie in the history of cinema and I will tell you my review of the Disney Cruise where I just came back from. I was on the Disney Cruise last week. The Star Wars Disney, Disney Cruise to be more specific. And uh, I'll tell you about that in the event that any of you as parents, sons, daughters, grandparents, whatever you might be, might find yourself in the line for that. But we start with what I think is a seismic story in the world of college sports and it's the ongoing fallout of the FBI investigation of the college basketball universe. Already Rick Pitino has lost his job at Louisville. Sean Miller has been pulled while he claims that he did nothing wrong. There are reports out of ESPN.com although that story seems a little bit shaky. Some of the factual details have had to be corrected. There's a lot of uncertainty surrounding it right now. While uh, there seems to be some uncertainty surrounding it, ESPN has reported that, that Sean Miller, the head coach of Arizona, is on tape offering DeAndre Ayton $100,000 if he comes to Arizona. This would be the greatest buy since Cam Newton at Auburn. If you could get an NBA lottery pick for $100,000, I think you have to do it. That's a steal for Sean Miller. But let's dive into this story because I think it's more complicated than the way it's been covered. First, let's begin here. If you listen to Outkick the Coverage, my morning show on nearly 300 stations nationwide, all 50 states, Sirius XM, millions of you downloading the podcast, if you do that, you would have heard Dan Wetzel in hour two this morning. And I gave him an over-under. I said, Dan, if I gave you an over-under of what number would you set for the number of Big Five coaches? Now, those of you out there who are aware of what the Big Five is, you should be. SEC, ACC, Pac-12, Big 12, and Big 10. How many Big Five coaches do you think the over-under on lost jobs should be? Head coaches. He said 20 or 25. That's how much data there is out there. So, if you are a Kentucky fan and you have been pointing at Louisville and making fun of Rick Pitino and walking around in your FBI versus Louisville bracket shirt, look out. John Calipari may be going down too. If you are an Arizona State fan 
and you have been reveling in the failures of Arizona, or if you're a UCLA fan or a USC fan, somebody out there who does not like Arizona basketball, look out. Here's what I would do. I want to start here. If I were in the in departments of any of these schools where they have allegations that players were paid, I would continue to play them. Same things with coaches, because I think the litigation on this case is likely to extend for years, and I think the likelihood of being able to definitively prove anything beyond a shadow of a doubt by the time the NCAA tournament starts is zero. And so if I were at Arizona, if I were at Kentucky, if I were at Alabama, if I were at any of these schools that have been uh, pointed to as potentially being in the wrong from NCAA issues, I'd continue to, pay my, to, to play my uh, players and I'd continue to play my coaches. Um, that is beyond a shadow of a doubt the decision that I would make because I think proving that you did something wrong would be almost impossible. And if it happens... Why would Arizona sit DeAndre Ayton? He denies getting paid. I'd like to see the last person who raised his hand and said, you know what, I was paid. Uh, but he denies getting paid. And if he is going to be paid, and if he was paid, and if it's later proven that he was paid, the whole season has to get vacated anyway. So why not go ahead and roll the dice and see how you can do the rest of the way? I think that is a no-brainer. I think that makes the, uh, the most sense. So I think the idea that you are sitting out there believing that your school is innocent. Some of the dumb, dumbest people in America, not surprisingly, I'm wearing my Kentucky blue shirt, are Kentucky Wildcat fans. If you are a Kentucky Wildcat fan and you legitimately believe that Kentucky and John Calipari was not doing the exact same thing that Sean Miller was, the exact same thing that Rick Pitino was, the exact same thing that Bruce Pearl was, I've got a bridge I would like to sell you. Coach Cal is dirty. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with being dirty relative to the NCAA rules, but if you are dumb enough to believe that Kentucky is clean, you are literally one of the dumbest, most biased sports fans in the history of the world. Kentucky is guilty, all right? That's the truth. Um, and I think a lot of other major programs are guilty as well. There is zero doubt. Now, if I were a Kentucky fan, I'd be like, screw it. We're playing by the rules like everybody else. Um, and the rules were not being followed. Here is the way that I would describe the, the crisis that college basketball finds itself in. It is a mixture between the subprime mortgage crisis and steroids. Now let me explain what I mean by that. If you remember back in 2008... As the economy collapsed and banks were going under, if you read the book The Big Short or if you at least saw the movie, the big question that was out there was, who has exposure to subprime mortgages? How many bad loans are there on the books? Nobody knew for sure. So all of those stock prices collapsed. And as a result, they collapsed because it was like trying to decide which glass of water did you feel comfortable drinking when you knew that some of them were poisoned. <clears throat> there was no way that you were going to touch them. Just like that, I think college basketball is the same way. Some college basketball programs right now are poison. If you got five-star talent, you are likely poison. But who is going to touch that glass other than the absolute partisan idiots and say, my guys are totally innocent. They did nothing wrong. Nobody with any kind of functional brain is going to be able to do that at all. So... I think the big question, in addition to this being like the subprime mortgage crisis, is steroids in baseball. Some people ask the question, why in the world is anybody out here doing this investigation? And it's an, it's an interesting question. Why is the FBI, which couldn't follow up on this shooter who killed 17 people in Broward County, able to do 3,000 pages worth of wiretaps for something that doesn't matter? In general, I agree with you. I think it makes no sense. But I would say this. I would say this in general. I would say this in general about this larger context. I want to give you a player's name. Matt, uh, uh, let me give you a player's name. Ken Griffey Jr. Ken Griffey Jr. was, I think most of you would agree, clean in an incredible era of dirty baseball. When everybody else was shooting themselves up with steroids, when Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire and Sammy Soso were setting absolute records that had never been uh, touched before in the history of baseball. Ken Griffey Jr. was clean. And he was clean batting against a ton of pitchers that were also dirty. If you believe that Ken Griffey Jr. is clean and he was competing against everybody else out there that was dirty, I do think in the college basketball universe, 
there are coaches that tried to follow NCAA rules and that are clean. And if that is true, then they were being unfairly, uh, they're playing on an unfair playing field because everybody else was slanting it in their direction. So that's where I have some limited issue of understanding why there might have needed to be an investigation here. Having said that, I still don't understand in any way why the FBI needed to investigate on a large scale, why they needed to bring charges like this, and why we care from a fraud perspective if guys were being paid and they were going to schools. It doesn't seem to me like the schools got a bad deal. DeAndre Ayton for $100,000 is a steal. Okay, If you could get an NBA lottery pick to come play at your school for a year for a hundred grand, I could afford to have bought DeAndre Ayton's services and sent him to whatever school I want to. Lots of people could have. Certainly the coaches could have. I think the big issue here is if everybody is cheating and it's a systemic failure, the NCAA has got a major issue in front of it. Now, I have long compared the NCAA to a traffic cop. I think they pull over a random person on the road, they read them the riot act, they tell them that they violated the rules, and then everybody else is speeding by. You probably have been at some point in your life on the side of the road when somebody ha getting a speeding ticket while somebody else has gone flying by beside you. Somebody else might have gone by faster than you were even speeding. And it makes you disrespect speeding laws in general because you say nobody follows them, why in the, why in the world would I? That is, I think, where the NCAA finds itself. Now, the bigger issue here is why does this exist? It's because the market is inefficient. When the market is inefficient, opportunities arrive, right? And the opportunity that arrives here is filled by agents. It's filled by shoe companies. It's filled, filled by anybody who believes they can make money off of these young players who are one day going to be multimillionaires, maybe even within nine months. If that is true, then what I always believe is the reason why a black market exists is as a failure of the market system in general. Why do I believe that most drugs should be legalized? Because there's a huge market, all right? Why does cocaine keep getting brought into the United States? Because there's a huge market for cocaine. Why does weed keep getting brought into the United States? Because there's a huge market for weed. Why does prostitution exist? Because a lot of guys want to have more sex with anonymous women than they're having, all right? This is not earth-shattering science here. Why do bookies exist? Why does gambling exist? Because lots of people want to wager on sports. My theory on that in general is to legalize it all and tax it. Now, on drugs, I would make some exceptions. I would accept drugs that are so dangerous you can die of them almost, uh, you know, and so addictive. I wouldn't allow heroin to be sold on the streets. I wouldn't allow opioids, which are killing like 50,000 people a year, to be sold. But in general, if you want to sell party drugs like cocaine, have at it. If you want to sell weed, have at it. If you want to be a prostitute, go sell your ass for the most you can possibly sell yourself for, right? Have at it. But the reason why those black markets exist is because there's a demand. There is a substantial demand for young basketball talent, and what is being paid for that young basketball talent does not meet that demand. So a scholarship and room and board is not enough. Now, that's where you get into an interesting debate here. That's why you get into an interesting debate, which is pay the players. What I would say about this is buckle up, pay attention. This is more complicated. First of all, if you pay male athletes in basketball and football, you have to pay, if you're paying them an equal amount, you have to pay every scholarship athlete because of Title IX. So every women's diver, every men's soccer player, every men's track and field, they all have to get paid just like scholarships have to be equal. The reality is this. College athletic programs are not actual, legitimate, market-based businesses. They're a hybrid. College athletics is socialism. The talent that a male basketball player has and the talent that a football player has is not adequately compensated relative to their sporting market demands. But the talent that a female soccer player or a male uh, tennis player has is overcompensated relative to what the market would suggest. Okay, so as a result, the money that those programs make, which are highly profitable, men's basketball and football, gets spent on all the other athletic departments as a result. And women's athletic programs are actually the biggest beneficiary of all of this. Because every women's athletic program in the country 
with the possible exception of Connecticut women's basketball, loses money. Okay, that's the truth. So, how do you fix it? You can't fix it by paying everybody more money. The only way that I can think of where you could do it is you could theoretically allow individual athletes to market themselves, to sell their autographs, to be able to make money in that way. Here's the complexity there. One, how do they price it? I sell ads all the time on Outkick the Show. I make the decision on what everything costs. It's complicated. I think the average 18-year-old kid in high school going into college is going to have no idea how to value himself. So the school probably has to sell his marketing rights. Moreover, the individual player shouldn't be able to sell or wouldn't be able to sell to anybody except people who already sponsor the individual uh, program. Let me give you an example. If you are a Nike school and you have a guy who goes out and says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sell uh, myself to Under Armour or to Adidas and sell my marketing gear. Well, the school already has a deal with Nike. You can't allow individual players to do that. Moreover, even in shoe money, I want you to think about this. How many guys in the NBA actually make a lot of shoe money? 20? Even in the NBA, which is the very highest level of college ba of, of pro basketball, there's hardly anybody that actually makes very much money from shoes. Yeah, LeBron James does. Yeah, maybe Kevin Durant does. Lonzo Ball might make a little bit. You can't do that in general. So, this idea that there's a ton of people who would have market value on college teams is frankly not true. Which is why my solution, which I think makes the most sense and doesn't get very much attention, is this. You should be able to go pro. If you want to avoid the money issue in college athletics, then you should let guys who have market value go pro. Let them go pro. If you are 18 years old and somebody in the NFL wants in the NFL or the NBA wants to draft you, go. You know, the NFL, Major League Baseball, tennis, golf, uh, all of those sports don't have age restrictions. Why are age restrictions considered permissible in the United States today just because a players union votes for them? Do you know why the players union votes for age restrictions? To help ensure that the members of the players union who aren't that good keep jobs. If LeBron James can go straight to the league and be great, if Kobe Bryant can, if Kevin Garnett can, if Tracy McGrady and Amari Stoudemire all can, they can all go. And this idea that you're going to be a failure if you go, everybody points to Kwame Brown. Kwame Brown went straight from high school to the pros. Do you know what Kwame Brown made in his career playing in the NBA? It's going to blow your mind. $63 million. Kwame Brown is not a failure. What I would do is say this. Every year that you want to make yourself draft eligible, especially when you come out of high school, you can do what you do in Major League Baseball. You put your name in the draft. You allow everybody to draft on you. If you get drafted, you can negotiate and decide whether or not you want to go to the NBA. If you don't, then you go to college for three years. In college football, I think you should be able to leave at any point. I changed my mind on this after Marcus Lattimore. I saw him carry the ball 40 times for 200 yards uh, as a freshman at South Carolina. Came back as a sophomore, tore up one knee. Came back as a junior, tore up the other knee. To me, this is no doubt at all. If you want to go pro in football, as violent and brutal as that game is, you should be able to go pro. If you don't want to go pro, you don't have to, but that would be my solution. That way the NCAA is not in the business of conducting investigations to see who or who did not get $100,000 in improper benefits, which is just a made-up phrase. Improper benefits is a made-up phrase from the NCAA because what it means basically is when you enter college, you have to leave college just as poor as you were before. Um, so to me, that's the solution. I'm not sure whether anybody will ever get to it, uh, but that's my analysis overall of the college basketball scandal. All right, LeBron versus Fox News. We in the media, we in the media have created a artificial universe for athletes who want to speak out on political related issues. We only praise them. Hardly anybody ever critiques them. Hardly anybody ever sits down and says, why don't you explain your overall thought processes when it comes to political beliefs? Remember how Sarah Palin had to sit down with Katie Couric and she got exposed and a lot of people said, my God, I can't believe John McCain 
picked this woman to be the next governor of Alaska. Everybody said, my God, this woman is not prepared to be a heartbeat away from the presidency. If you want to get involved in politics and make political arguments, then you should have to sit for a rigorous interview just like anybody else who wants to get involved in politics does. I have gone on and talked about politics before. Guess what? I'd be comfortable sitting down on CNN or Fox News and answering any question about my political beliefs. That's because there's a foundation to it. My beliefs would be coherent. You may not agree with me, but it makes sense. Does anybody think that if LeBron James actually sat down and got grilled for 25 minutes about his political beliefs that you would leave thinking, my God, this is a guy who's well-versed in politics? Of course not. So I actually defend Laura Ingram here from Fox News because she has been saying to people who were in the entertainment realm for a long time, shut up and do what you do. For a long time, she started this with the Dixie Chicks. She said, shut up and sing. She has said, shut up and act. She has said it all the time, right? She has said it over and over and over again. I think it's very valid to say to LeBron James, if he is going to comment on politics, shut up and drip. You are in the business of entertaining people for basketball. And I would say shut up and coach to Greg Popovich. And I would say shut up and coach to Steve Kerr. And I would say shut up and uh, play football to anybody else out there who wants to get political and decide to be an expert in politics. I don't know why this is confusing. Certainly people say to me all the time on my Twitter feed, shut up and talk about sports. They have the right to say that. When you step into any arena, you have the right to be criticized. That's how the First Amendment works. It's really fascinating to me. The, 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 there are so many people out there who always say, well, that's his First Amendment right. I heard that about Colin Kaepernick. Well, that's his First Amendment right to protest. People think, just like when you get offended, that your right to be offended is the only person who can do that. They think that they, the First Amendment only runs one way. Just like being offended only runs one way, which is why my response whenever somebody says I'm offended is to say, you're offended? Offended by what? I'm offended that you're offended. And that person has no idea how to respond. When you enter the marketplace of ideas, everybody has the right to comment on your opinion. And if your opinion is not that smart, like Colin Kaepernick's wasn't during the protest, then you're fair game. That's how the marketplace of ideas work. The First Amendment is a two-way street. LeBron James has the right to say whatever he wants to about political candidates. And Laura Ingram has the right to fire back at him and say, ah, that's not a very smart opinion. Shut up and dribble. That's how America works. Just like she would have the right on the Oscars this weekend when somebody gets up at the Oscars and makes some ground left-wing pronouncement, you can just say, shut up and act. I pay you to act, not to share your political opinion. And what's fascinating about this is I feel like most people don't care about actor or actress political opinions because we're so used to it. You know what you're going to get. Hollywood is going to be left-wing. Somebody's going to win an Oscar and they're going to stand up and they're going to tell you that the whales have to be saved. And I'm going to tell Leonardo DiCaprio, you know what? You're a great actor. You were amazing in Aviator. You were amazing in Catch Me If You Can. I loved you as J. Edgar Hoover. I love watching you act. The Wolf of Wall Street was amazing. But I don't give one iota what your political opinions are. You know why? Because I see you as an actor. That's the way I view every single athlete. I see you as an athlete. Doesn't mean you're not entitled to your opinion. Just means that I am 100% confident. 1 billion percent confident that there are tons of people out there who are every bit as smart, if not smarter, about politics than LeBron James. I don't sit around thinking, you know what? I think Greg Popovich and LeBron James are two of the greatest minds of our era when it comes to political thought. I wonder what they think about larger political issues. Not once have I ever thought to myself, you know what? I'm really intrigued what Greg Popovich and LeBron James think about campaign finance reform law. I can't wait to see them break down the nitty gritty of that. I understand that they are athletes. They can talk about that. But this idea that they are political or, God forbid, that it was racist, that's what people say now if you criticize their opinion and they're a minority. Immediately, if you are white, God forbid you're a white man like me, every opinion that I share is racist. 
I can't, I literally can't share any opinion without it being immediately called racist. You can disagree with every single one of my opinions, but using race as a justification for why you disagree with my opinion is not actually disagreeing with the opinion. That's just you attacking me and trying to delegitimize my First Amendment rights based on my race. I don't think Laura Ingram said that about LeBron James because he was black. I think she said it because he's an athlete. Just like I don't think she said it about Greg Popovich because he's white or said it about the Dixie Chicks because they're white. I think her perspective is her arena is politics. If your arena is not politics, don't step into it unless you want to get dunked on. I think there's some truth to that. Um, so I think all that factors in. All right. I was on, I'm going to tie this all together. I was in the Disney cruise. Uh, my name is Clay Travis. It's Outkick the Show. I went on the Disney cruise for the last week. Got sick, came back. You can hear it in my voice. Um, when you become a parent, you don't go on vacation anymore. You go on family trips. So I went on a family trip, a cruise, with my three boys, 10, 7, and 3, one room uh, on the cruise ship. Uh, we went all over the place. They have all the Disney movies on it. So I was actually excited to watch Black Panther. I saw it like the day after it came out, or two days after it came out, on the Disney cruise. They show every movie. Before I get to Black Panther... I do want to say I rewatched The Last Jedi in a theater. And I think I was harsh on The Last Jedi. The most recent Star Wars movie was better than I gave it credit for. I actually thought on a rewatch it was really well done. So I was too critical of that. Having said that, I sat down for Black Panther, seeing that it's the highest rated movie of all time, expecting a transcendent, amazing cinematic experience. It was just okay. It was just an average superhero movie. It wasn't as good as Iron Man. It wasn't as good as the Batman trilogy. It wasn't as good as Deadpool. It wasn't as good as Guardians of the Galaxy. It wasn't as good as Captain America Winter Soldier. All of those movies, by far, were better. Zero doubt. It was poorly plotted. I thought everybody's praising Michael B. Jordan. I loved him as Vince on Friday Night Lights. There was no rhyme or reason to his character. In five minutes, he goes from a character you don't know to the new king of Wakanda. It made no sense. Um, the plot in general made no sense. The CGI graphics at the end, my God, the rhinoceroses, were awful. Just a joke, just to watch. I mean, it was a disaster. Now, I know that inevitably, because I didn't like the Black Panther, that now is racist. Because if you don't like a movie with black people in it now, you're racist. Here's the deal. If this movie had had Asian people or Hispanic people as the starring roles, and it was called like the Yellow Panther, or it was called the Brown Panther, and it was set in Mexico, or it was set in Asia, and everything else about this movie was no different at all, nobody would be singing its praises. The only reason why this is getting praised is because it's called Black Panther and because it has a majority black cast. By the way, Blade had a majority black cast that I remember, certainly a, uh, a superhero, black superhero lead, and it was infinitely better. Blade 1 and 2 was infinitely better than Black Panther. Here's the deal. This is also evidence. I don't know if you saw my Twitter feed after I said that I didn't like this movie. People are like, oh, you're racist. This is how we people who think that the country hasn't advanced. I want you to sit around and think for a minute. In 1862, you were racist if you owned slaves and argued that slavery should continue forever because black people were inherently inferior to white people. In 1896, you were racist if you didn't want black people to be sitting next to you on buses or movie theaters or train cars or uh, trolleys because of separate versus equal. In 1950s, 40s, 30s, 60s, you were racist if you didn't believe that black people, certainly in the South, deserve the right to vote. In 2018, it's considered racist if you say, eh, I thought that Black Panther movie was just okay. If I say that the movie was just okay, that's how far we've devalued racism. People on social media come after me and say, oh my God, it's racist that you didn't think Black Panther was the greatest movie of all time. People are comparing it to The Godfather. The Godfather. Shawshank Redemption, some of the best films of my life, Black Panther was a pale approximation of that film. And I'm not saying pale approximation because of my attempt to whitewash history. 
it just wasn't very good. It was an average movie. I think that Black Panther is the most overrated movie in the history of movies if you consider that it's average and it's rated as the greatest film of all time. That's what I'm just saying. Um, all right. Now, the Disney Cruise. The Disney Cruise was great. As I said, I was wrong on The Last Jedi. It's possible I missed all the plot intricacies and wow moments from Black Panther. I don't think that I did. I don't think that I missed that it was poorly written. I don't think that I missed that it didn't really have any kind of rhyme or reason. That Michael B. Jordan made no sense. That the plot itself was a mess. I don't think I missed any of that. But maybe I did. The great thing about the Disney Cruise was they had open theaters where you could watch basically every movie. Inside of our room, they had every Pixar movie, every Disney movie that's ever existed. Great pools. Here's the problem. I'm not a cruise guy because, and, and I haven't been on a cruise in like 13 years, but I reinforced this. I don't like being on a boat and not being able to leave. We were supposed to go to Cozumel in the Mayan Riviera. We were supposed to go to the Grand Caymans, and we were supposed to go to Jamaica. On the morning we were supposed to go to Jamaica, it was too rough. And they came over the loudspeaker and they said, we're not going to be able to dock. And at that point in time, I suddenly crystallized, oh my God, I'm on this ship all day Wednesday. I'm on this ship all day Thursday. We're going to a Disney Island in the Bahamas on Friday. And then I have to leave on Saturday. If they had told me, hey, we've got a, we've got a helicopter. We can take you to land. I would have put my family on the plane and gone to land. And just spent the next several days at Disney World. I don't like being stuck on a boat. All right. Some of you may love it. I also don't like that the boat rocks. It took me a couple of days after the boat got back for the rocking to stop. I also don't like that I'm in a tiny room, even when we're paying a lot of money for a room, it was no wider than like three people, basically. You couldn't pass two people. We had one bed for my wife and me, and then we had three bunk beds for each of the boys. We had a balcony and all this stuff. I'm not a boat guy. I don't like boats. I like my feet on land. I like islands. I lived on an island in the Virgin Islands. That's where I got my law license to begin with in the U.S. Virgin Islands. But I want to be on the ground. I'm a terra firma guy, not a boat guy. And so if you are like me and you are a parent and your kids absolutely will love it, this is the kind of sacrifice that you make for your kids. They loved it. I asked my kids to rate the Disney Cruise on a scale of 1 to 10. They gave it a 100. A 100 on a scale of 1 to 10 is good. They don't realize it yet. What an amazing dad I am. I don't go on vacation anymore. I got like 50 jobs so we can go on the Disney cruise. And when I don't wake up at 4 a.m. to do the show, what do I do? I get on a boat in the middle of the ocean with my three kids in a tiny room for seven days. That's the truth. My wife was okay with it. My wife was okay with it. Disney cruises are not for the parents. They're for the kids. It was expensive. Steve Young, by the way, also on my Disney cruise. Steve Young uh, was also on the cruise. Only a person other than, uh, than our crew who I recognize, Steve Young. I would be interested to hear what he thought. You can tag him on Twitter and ask him what he thinks of the Disney cruise. Uh, but I love all of you guys. Um, I am Clay Travis. The show is back. We are off and running. Thanks to my new sponsor. We have the new backdrops here, sportsbookreview.com. Get ready for the conference tournaments. I will be in St. Louis for the SEC basketball tournament. Go to thehomeloanexpert.com, and if you get lucky, you can watch some of those games with me. I love all of you. This has been Outkick the Show. I'll be live tomorrow, 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern, as I always am, on Outkick the Coverage. Hopefully my throat doesn't die. Also, a bit more big news. I now have a book coming out in the fall. I've added another job onto all of the others. That is awesome. DBAP boys and girls, love all of you. My name is Clay Travis. This has been Outkick the Show.